Great Parent Molly, and this is fellow Not Great Parent Nathan. Hello, you were very excited. I know, I really tried to put a little energy into it because I think I'm feeling not very energetic today. Are you not feeling energetic? So maybe that was a lot of fake, guys. Yeah, that's right. You're trying, you, it's because you're trying to have a great podcast episode. Trying to have a good podcast episode. Well, I don't know. The amount of fakeness you that put into true. that, that felt true. a lot like greatness. It did. It was a little greatness. Let's just be the boring people we are and let you, the <laughs> listener, deal with it. Yeah. Welcome to the Boring Podcast. This is who I am. Deal with it. Yeah, deal with me and my downer day. No, yes. and nothing's wrong. I just don't feel some don't days. Don't have the energy. Some days I have more energy than others. So. Well, and I think, you know, we, uh, uh, this would just be a little insight for people. We filmed this after lunch and my. <laughs> Depends what we eat. Yeah, I think my, I had a, I had a, uh, I had a salad, so I'm feeling okay. But if I ever have to film this after having like something that's fried, I'm immediately oh, like. Yeah. Well, it's time to take a nap. <laughs> Those <laughs> carbs are... Uh, yeah, yeah, getting a little sleepy And here. you got a Chick-fil-A cup, so I it's healthy. I did go to Chick-fil-A. I, ate, I made a healthy choice there. There you go, I, so... Yeah, and I had lunch with a friend, so that was good. Oh, that's good. So all that's good. So, so maybe and, I am just chipper. Maybe it's real. Maybe it's real. So we've come around to Molly's oh, actually in a really good mood. I'm actually in a good place. Yeah, but I think that's good because that's what we're talking about in this... Uh, the, the Your little segue there oh, actually yeah. works out. Yeah, we're, we've been in this series called Parenting Makes Me Crazy, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been kind of dealing with both our mental health as parents, but also our kids' mental health and how we can help them, and we're getting close to the end of this series. I think we're only going to have a couple more episodes. Yeah. and a couple good ones, I think. Yeah, I hope. I hope. It'll certainly not be great. It, won't, so it will not be great. We can promise you this. We will never be great. We won't. Uh, but... I do think uh, in this particular episode, I know what we wanted to talk about is for you and your in your person. At, this episode, we wanted to talk to... I was like, wait a minute. I don't remember this being an episode about me and my this, mental health. <laughs> this is now just us breaking down Molly. That's but <laughs> But for you in your temperament, mm -hmm. my, me and my temperament, you talked about you went to lunch mm -hmm. with a friend. That's often an energizing thing for That us. is often. Yes, yeah. it, it's very life-giving to me to... Right. Spend time connecting with another person, having yes. real conversation. Um, you know, it, it's definitely not an exhausting thing to me right. for the most part. Yes. And so I thrive on those scenarios. Well, and I think everyone's temperament is different, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's important to mention relationships are by their nature. I wouldn't say all relationships are this way, but but relationships by their nature are meant to be life-giving. Mm -hmm. And there are some of us, I think, you and I are not this temperament, but there are some of us who, because of the way we're wired up, being with people kind of drains us a little mm -hmm. bit. And so I meet a lot of people who think, oh, I'd be okay if you just left me on an island by myself. And there's probably a truth to your energy level. You'd right. be a little less drained. Uh, but... Human beings were made for relationships, and the way that it works with our energy is unique. Molly and I are the kind of people that when I'm with any group of people, it energizes me. Uh -huh. Like if, if I go to, you know, if we have a meeting that's late at church or something, and by late I mean like ends at 8 o'clock, uh -huh. I can't go to sleep afterwards. I, I'm wired up. You're ticking. Your mind it makes yeah. you get you going. But my wife, if we if she's been at the church, like she's at the church office today. If she's there at 2 o'clock for more than an hour, she comes home, she's ready to go to sleep at 4 o'clock when she's she comes ready. home. <laughs> but as a stay-at-home mom, she would tell you relationships are critical. Even though mm -hmm. the time with people can often be a little draining and she has to have time alone to then kind of recharge, mm -hmm. if she doesn't have those adult you know, interactions where she's able to not just talk to an 11-year-old or a 7-year-old, it is that that becomes life draining, right? Her. Because the relational part is life giving. Yes. It's the way that we d cope with it or deal with it on the back end that yes. often makes us feel like we don't want the relationship at all. Right. And so we say that to say what we're going to talk about today. Some of you, because of the way your temperament is, you are convinced. No, I'm, you know, I'm an island. I can be all by myself and that's all that I, I need. I never had to talk to anybody again. I'd be fine. Yes. Or I just need me and my spouse or I just need me, me and, and my kids. kids or whoever it is. Me and my dog. Yeah. <laughs> that's not the relationships we're talking about, the pet one. <laughs> no. And so in particular, when we talk about mental health, <laughs> one critical aspect to us being, you know, we've been talking about emotionally responsible. Mm -hmm. The way for me to know, make sure I'm taking care of my mental and emotional health, it is critical for me to have people in my life. 
Um, have you found that to be true for yourself? Oh, absolutely. And not just people in general, but people that I um, am willing to be a little bit vulnerable with. Sure. Maybe not, you know, too, maybe not all the time yeah. too much. People that um, take an interest in me mm. <laughs> and um, people that I go alongside with and do things with sometimes. Yes. I think those things are all very important to me yeah. and important to uh, my mental health to know mm -hmm. that, hey, I have these relationships, but not only are they just between me and that person, but we're doing things together yes. that, for the good of other people. That is, yes. all, that is the most life-giving relationships for me. Well, and I think... I think it was important for us to kind of bring up this idea that we're talking about today of how important relationships are because it, to our mental health in particular, right. because often when people think about uh, their mental health and mm -hmm. they think about how am I going to address this, it usually is um, them alone with their thoughts Yes. Or them alone with their thoughts and a therapist. Right. You know, it's like my, me. It's, the operative word is my mental health, right? Like yes. we're thinking my health and it's everything that goes in in my head. And it's all yes. the things that are happening up here and I can choose to share it or not, which is true. Right. But um, I think it's just very much mental health isn't something that we freely talk about quite sure. as much. We talked about that in a previous episode. Well, I think even if you don't, talk about your mental health with someone because I think often when people talk about like oh I need to I need to talk to my about my mental health they want to talk to a professional and often maybe it's because they want professional advice sometimes I think people want a professional because they're like this is a transactional relationship yes I don't I, there's no I don't have any owner there's nothing other than I'm going to tell them what I've got going on and they're going to tell me what's going on yes. and I don't ex they don't have an expectation of me or me of that right them. <laughs> but there is a different kind of thing that is important for our mental health which are these non-transactional these deeply intimate committed kind of relationships and something I think has happened you know we've been we've talked about it a lot in our sermons at, on Sunday but I know lots of people are talking about it there's this loneliness epidemic that is just um, it is huge uh, yeah and it has become a really a cancer to our mental health in that all of the kind of mental health things people um, really kind of see as dangerous, you know, like extreme anxiety, mm -hmm. um, you depression. know, extreme depression or, you know, suicidal thoughts even, those things grow in isolation. Mm -hmm. When you are just alone, even if you're just alone with you and your spouse. Yeah, you know. I think it's important to say when we're, when we're talking about the word isolation, we're not just talking about somebody who is isolated by themselves yes. in a place by themselves and not, doesn't talk to me. You can be and feel incredibly isolated yes. when you're around other people. <laughs> well, I think you can be isolated, especially I think most people I know, and this has become, uh, when we talk about greatness, the kind of American dream greatness mm -hmm. uh, is me and my family. We have really turned the nuclear family in, oh, we've almost idolized it. We've mm -hmm. made it something it was never meant to be. We've made marriage something it wasn't meant to be. This idea that my spouse should be my ultimate best friend, uh, that, that this is the person that is supposed to complete every part mm -hmm. of me, that if it were just... <laughs> Me, what? I just thought of that movie, Jerry Maguire. Or oh, yes. You complete me. That's when, that was the turning point, guys. Yes, it, well, I think, <laughs> I think, I don't know that it was the turning point. It was certainly, it certainly kind of it encapsulated. It resonated for people. Yeah, it encapsulated something I think that had already gone. And, you know, when you read, when you read like, um, so I'll give you like an example of this. The big one that I think people ended up talking about a lot was in the 2000s when the uh, Lord of the Rings movie came out. Mm -hmm. And you look at Sam and Frodo's relationship oh, yes. and the amount that people kind of giggled about it. Uh -huh. And they almost turned it into this romantic, you yes. know, almost sexual relationship between the two. Because they had never seen, we don't see in movies a lot, these two men who can have this intimate, vulnerable, loving relationship. Without that part of it. Without, without some romantic, because in our mind, the greatest intimacy you should have is me and my spouse, we're best friends. And this idea that I would have that with another person where I could be vulnerable, mm -hmm. where I could, they could know what's going on in my life. It feels wrong to say, oh, my spouse is one of the people who has access mm -hmm. to that part of my life. But there may be people, and there are people in my life, and my wife knows this, there are things about my life that there are uh, friends I have in this church that they know about 
that she does not know mm -hmm. about. Because, and, but, and I've told her, hey, this is the thing. With the intent of it leading you to a good relate, I mean, well, yeah. good things for you in your life. It is ultimately because, uh, and this is the part I think that in even saying that people go, well, who are you talking about? What What is this? Because the idea that most people have is the goal should be ultimately that I and my spouse become the end all be all of my life. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that's one, a lot of pressure to put on another mm -hmm. person. A lot. And if you look, once again, if you, if you, if you look throughout the Bible, there seems to be this big talk about friendships, brothers and sisters in Christ, that your spouse is hopefully a brother or sister in Christ, mm -hmm. right? But also that you have these other relationships. And I think what has happened is this American dream, which, I mean, we could talk about a lot, but ultimately it was, you know, you look at like Thomas Jefferson, the idea was everyone gets to be their own king of their own plot of land and that they have, that it's just them and their family and they're isolated out. You got 150 right. acres that you live on and you might need things from other people, but you have all your rights they're to do what you want. self-sustained and you have your own yes. rules and your own, and really at the center of that is me. Yes, because the idea behind it was we can all have the life I want out on my own little piece of land by myself, the problem with that is that's not the biblical view of, of life. No, that is not the good view that God outlines no. for us. And that's, you know, that's what we talk about in here is living our life good and not great. So living within the goodness as the Bible speaks to and the examples that we have from the Bible rather than this greatness that the world today or in the past has even outlined for us. And so it's, um, not, we're not meant to have a me world <laughs> and no. we're not meant to have an alone world or an isolated world either. Mm -hmm. And so we have to stop and take a look at our own lives and go, okay, yes. who is in my life? Well, and when you, and when you look at what happened in, in COVID, mm -hmm. everyone kind of got the American dream. They just didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it was just you and your family trapped in a, in a home together. Remember how that went. <laughs> and everyone loved it and it was great. <laughs> Or maybe. How was it for you? <laughs> everyone eventually goes, oh my God, I need, and, and, and I think people started to feel pretty guilty about it. Mm -hmm. I, it turns out I do need more than just me and my spouse. I do need other people than just me and my spouse to be okay. Does that mean there's something wrong with my marriage? That, yeah, or I don't really like being here all the time. Yes, it's a little draining. And turns out that they, this person does not satisfy all the needs I have. Mm -hmm. And then you go, but I thought that's the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so all these things. And then, of course, then, of course, if you're not married, well, we don't even have a picture of that. Mm -hmm. We have this. Well, I mean, we do, but I would say Christians often don't have a picture right. of it. Our world does, which is usually you satisfy your needs with whoever's nearby. Right. It's, <laughs> go out and do whatever. Sure. You, you have someone you drink with. You have someone you go out and fool around with. You have yeah, a person you do this. For different things. Everyone's got their own thing, but it's not really deep, intimate, vulnerable relationships. Mm -mm. And what has happened is in the middle of all of this, the greatness that we've pursued, which is me and everything I want, mm -hmm. it has kept me from being able to have these kind of relationships. And I think when it comes to parenting, parenting is incredibly isolating. Oh, it's terribly isolating because I think it's really easy, one, to think we're the only one that has something going on. Yes. So I know when my child, my child was born and he had a medical condition, I decided I was the only one that had ever had to deal with that mm. in that way. And people would come, talk to me and they would say, I know what you feel, or I, you know, this was my scenario. And immediately my head went to, well, that is yours, not mine. We don't mm. have anything in common. Right. And so I would shut that person off or yeah. whatever. But even the small things, I think day to day, we, oh, we yeah. feel very much like I'm the only one that has to deal with a bratty kid or sure. I'm the only one whose child did this or that, or I'm the only one who's feeling like, you know, some of those confessions we talked about in the last, That's right. I'm the only one who's feeling this or that. And so one, we already feel we're the only one. And mm -hmm. second of all, if we don't have those relationships in our life to yes. talk to people about those yes. things, then we're, we haven't got two strikes, right? We're already feeling isolated and we don't have an outlet to speak to that. Well, and I think what, I think this is why you see these rise of what we call influencers on social media, especially like mommy influencers. I don't oh, know if they're there's everywhere. Like dad influencers. They're probably oh, there are. are. But, but certainly like the mommy blogger, mommy influencer. And what happens is people start to feel connected because for the first time there's someone who will actually say, 
oh yeah, my kid, my kid's a mess, and they did right. X, Y, and Z, and then you go, oh, we're the same, and then they go, buy this bag. <laughs> Because yeah. it turns out, and you realize eventually, oh, we're not actually friends. You're trying to sell me something. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get me to be your follower. And then that becomes even more isolating. Mm -hmm. This person you finally thought, oh, my God, someone actually said the thing I thought. Right. But it wasn't a person. It's that not you, a two-way relationship. It's not two. And it's very transactional. Mm -hmm. And we, we were designed to have these relationships where... I can be invested in the life of another person. And I can be vulnerable enough to say these things I'm scared no one else thinks. And when I do, and they look back at me and say, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, not that particular thing, but yeah, we all struggle with something. Yeah. And even being able to say it, there's something healing that happens to our mental health, but also us spiritually, our soul as a person, everything about us, mm -hmm. it, 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 we were made for relationships. Yes, because when we sit in isolation it's really uh sometimes terrifying what happens yeah. in isolation i mean i think a lot of times people don't realize how isolated they are but everything gets magnified or grows yeah. our fears are bigger our depression can be bigger our you know worries can be bigger and it really can take over and like we talk about consume us and that that isn't where we want to be and especially it isn't where god wants us to be Or what I'm seeing in the counseling space is um, once you take um, emotions and you get them out of your own head and you get them out into what I call getting them out into space mm -hmm. or laying them out on the table, um, they start to look and seem quite different than what they sound in your own head. I mean, we've all had this experience probably. <laughs> I know where you're going with this. <laughs> of, of, I'm, I've got these ideas and I'm thinking these thoughts and I'm having... I'm, those internal dialogues that I'm mm -hmm. having with myself, shower or with an, fights that you're yeah, having, or with an imaginary in your mind person, that the right? It, they're going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and I've got all this stuff. Squash and it's them just, like a bug. <laughs> yeah, it's just in my head, okay. And then I finally actually sit down, or I, or I get with a friend, and I start talking about how I'm feeling. And the more I say it, the more sometimes ridiculous it sounds, or the more it just doesn't make as much sense as it did in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've had this experience in the counseling space where um, a person will be talking to me about, you know, someone in their life or a frustration that they're having or just, just all the emotions that are swirling around in their head. And I actually had someone say this to me one time, right in the middle of them talking, they just went, I'm starting to realize how ridiculous this sounds. <laughs> yeah. And I said, that's okay. I said, this is not a bad mm -hmm. thing. I said, in fact, don't, don't stop. stop. Mm -hmm. Keep talking because the more you do, the more you'll put some put some sense and some handles onto what you're feeling. So I say all that to say that's why relationships are so important because you don't have that uh, outward processing when it's just you. Right. And, so, and, and the other part that's so important about relationships is they can then reflect back mm -hmm. what they're hearing you say mm -hmm. and you hear it from another perspective and you get hopefully a little bit of understanding and empathy mm -hmm. because the truth is there is not an emotion that you've ever felt that there isn't someone who had a similar feeling. Right. right. And we get into the, these spaces so often where we just think, well, it's just me or I'm something's wrong with me. Nobody else gets this or nobody else has these <coughs> Nobody's thoughts. Nobody's ever Nobody's been, ever been through this. No one's walking in my shoes. Exactly. And that's where, you know, I hate to go too far down the road, but that's what leads people to that deepest, darkest mm -hmm. place of despair where mm -hmm. if no one gets this and I am so defective and I'm the only one, then why am I even here? Mm -hmm. And that gets real dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to get those things out, not just to hear them, not just to get perspective on them, but to, to actually have a person reflect love and empathy and compassion back to you so that it actually can become more normalized. Mm -hmm. And we always say around here, we're, you know, we're not intended to do life alone. Nope. Mm -hmm. And that means in all aspects of our mm -hmm, life mm -hmm. and if we're not around other people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we aren't going to have those opportunities for relationships i know i yep. know a lot of people are saying we we've talked about how a lot of people are isolated more yes. than ever now yeah. and and that impacts your mental health that is mm -hmm. something that has a lot of effect on you and in well, this conversation yeah. is one of the well, ways and if and if for those of us who've been in the mental health world the past mm -hmm. couple of years, um, the mental health requests for counseling oh, skyrocketed, skyrocketed right? right around COVID. And mm -hmm. you can see it. 
it's actually starting to sort of normalize again. I will mm -hmm. say that, but that goes to your point of once we isolated for a time, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm not making a political statement on whether we should mm -hmm. or shouldn't. It just happened. But what happened caused a lot of what you're talking about. A lot of people did not have that outlet. They didn't have mm -hmm. that place. And and not just for those of us who like isolation and yeah. are internal yeah. processors. All of us yeah. were not meant to have that for any lengthy, experience, extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And so you, it, it caused a lot of people to stay within mm -hmm. for way too long mm -hmm. and to not have that outlet. And then uh, relationships got lost mm -hmm. sometimes in the shuffle or those natural places where we get those kinds of mm -hmm. reflections and those kinds of feedback. Um, they just didn't, they weren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And it built up for a lot of people. And I think we talked about this on the last episode is, Every time you take an, I'm not saying you should be the kind of person that walks around and just spewing all over the place, your emotions. Um, but, <laughs> with your um, wheel, yeah. with your emotions. But yeah. <laughs> there is a sense that every time I internalize uh, a negative emotion, mm -hmm. that it does create a little bit of pressure right. within my heart and soul, my, my, my whole being. And so every time I do that, and you know, we stuff it down, we stuff it down, we stuff it down, the pressure just grows. Mm -hmm. And it's going to come out somehow. It's yeah. going to come out in maybe anger towards somebody you didn't want to hurt, or it's going to come out in some deep despair that you, know, you, mm -hmm. you can't quite seem to get out of. And so it's important to relieve that pressure valve, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. what relationships do for us. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think when you talk about what, what most of us experienced during COVID, but I, I realized... You know, when I would talk to people, um, certainly we were all more isolated than we were before. But what became clear to me the more I talked to people is some of us had, and I think a lot of people had uh, already begun the isolation long before COVID. Yes, and, what co did. and what COVID did was just expose that. Because like you said, you have those little touch points mm -hmm. of, oh, I'm kind of, you know, shooting the breeze with people at work and this. But those kind of deep, meaningful relationships... Mm -hmm didn't already really exist. And I think that often happens a lot. And we talk, we've talk, we talked about this on here before. I think parents get in that place a lot where you get so in the weeds of parenting and, you know, shoot, shooting for greatness mm -hmm. for your kids. Well, that means I got to take them to this ball practice and that thing. And my, my weekdays and my weekends are me just shuffling the kids around. I don't have many. And talking to other parents about greatness. Yeah, and, <laughs> but mostly in five-minute things because we yeah, know little this blips here and there. from from leading uh, our discipleship program here where we're trying to ask people to invest in relationships, and there are tons of people that have that, and they go, I see tons of people, I talk to people, I, I have no meaningful relationships with any of those people because we're having three-minute touch points with people. And what happens, I think, for parents a lot of times is maybe even with your spouse, but if you're a single, if you're a single parent, for sure, there are not many meaningful adult relationships in your life mm -hmm. where you could say that because you don't want to, nor really should you, dump all of those emotions on your kid. So you can't sit with them and say, let me tell you about what I'm now realizing about how my mom raised me and how and this how was how they wrong. screwed me up. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't need to have that conversation with them, but you probably need to have it with somebody. Yes. You probably need to sit with somebody, and it may be going to a counselor but it also may be sitting with your spouse mm -hmm. or sitting with a friend and just saying, man, I just, I, I'm feeling this. And like you said, even just in the act of saying it, it doesn't even take the other person to say, uh, oh, that's mm -hmm. normal or, oh, that's this. You see it in their face. You feel it. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense of intimacy and connection. And so the reason I bring that up is to say one of the things we do here as a church is this parent ministry mm -hmm. where we want to partner you with other parents, but also with these older veteran parents who have been through it, who you can have those conversations with. I know both of y'all are kind of on the team that, mm -hmm. that yeah. prepares a lot of those things. So I thought maybe Jason could talk about how do you, how do you see in not only as someone who has been doing counseling, but somebody who is a pastor how do you see for our church what the benefit of that could be for parents who are in this mm. relational isolation? Well, it goes back to what we said last time. It's it, it's all about normalizing my experience. Right. Because mm. I get in this space where I think, 
there are no answers or uh, I'm weird or I'm, you know, I, there's something wrong with me because I'm going through these certain challenges or I'm having these feelings or these thoughts about my parenting journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and just sitting across the table, I tell this, I'll, I'll set it up this way. I tell the veteran parents that we have on our team this all the time because that often their, their pushback on me is, well, I don't have anything to offer this mm-hmm. younger generation because either I, I don't think I did it very well right. or I just don't feel like I know a lot. I, I, I know a lot about what I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I go, that's what we need. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's perfect. That is exactly what this younger generation needs. They need someone to actually sit there and say, yeah, you feeling like you don't have a clue is the way parenting feels. Mm-hmm. That's right. And you feeling like I kind of maybe I'm just making this up as I go sometimes. Yeah, that's how it feels. Mm-hmm. Right. And I went through that. And, you know, in some ways, I, I raised a kid and they turned out pretty okay. Or right. they didn't. Either way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, ex- you still had that experience. I had this experience. I, you will live through it. Right. And, and, it, and, and it, it, you don't have to be perfect or right. great like we talk right. about around here. It's just... You're you're okay, you know. Mm-hmm. Just you know, sometimes it just it just gives you that sense of I need to calm down a bit mm-hmm. and not freak out about every single thing. You know, it's mm-hmm. we talk about this in a lot of the parenting events that we do. You know, there'll be one incident, you know, a one um, moment at school or one uh, something that happens on social media or you know, in my house, it's there's some girl drama going on. Mm-hmm. I have two girls. There's always girl drama going yes. on, and we often think that this one moment of crisis that I have with my child <laughs> is the the thing that's going to scar them forever right. and ever and ever. Right. And it never is. Mm-hmm. And so to have a parent who said, oh, yeah, I remember. In fact, it just happened the other night. My wife was on the phone with a, a parent of a, the younger generation, and they were talking about something they're going through with their kid. And, um, and she said, it just feels like it's the, their whole world right now. Mm-hmm. And my wife was even able to come in and go, you know what? When our kid was about six years old, we went through something very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And here's what happened. And we thought it was the end of the world. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We're okay. Mm -hmm. She's okay. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be okay, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That right there can get you through some of those things. Absolutely. yeah. Just knowing that. I'm gonna be okay, mm-hmm. and my or kids. Or just being be the okay. ears that listen and the yeah. the person that responds, and you know yeah. somebody that is there to hear him. It's huge. It's well, very I think good. there's this feeling, and this goes to the greatness of things that my job is to, to, as a parent, is to produce something. And even I think within Christian parents, mm-hmm. my job is to produce a child <laughs> who goes on to love God and love people, and that is what we want. Sure. But it is not my job to, I cannot produce Yeah, I was going to say, change mm-hmm. the word produce. Yeah. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the bad word. Yeah, that's, that's right. I can't, I can't, <laughs> can't produce, produce this thing. thing. Mm-hmm. No. I want this to happen yeah. in their life. And so what I, I used to say this all the time to um, our youth ministry volunteers when I did youth ministry. But now uh, Jennifer and I have to remind each other, going back to the uh-huh. benefit of relationships, is in our marriage we're able to say, I used to say to them all the time when a kid has a, horrible blow up and meltdown or they're just not behaving the way they're supposed to Mm -hmm. in a small group or Mm -hmm. you know for our kids just in the house they're not behaving the way they're supposed to and then some adult has to step in the parent or the small group leader has to step in and get on to them and that kid responds and goes I hate you or you know oh I'm never going to come back to this group again or whatever and they would leave (laughs) I would always come back to them and go Everyone did what they were supposed to do. Mm-hmm. I said, they're supposed to be disrespectful. <laughs> they're supposed to not behave. Now, when this is the problem. Most of us think supposed to means like morally what they are obligated. No, it doesn't mean they did what God wanted them to do. It's normal. It means this is what is supposed to happen in the life of a teenager. Mm-hmm. And everyone's going to. There is no way to create a child that never disrespects their parent or never disobeys. And you did what you were supposed to do in being the bad mom. Mm-hmm. And being the one who steps in and I'm mean, mm-hmm. I'm I'm the mean one, because that is needed too. Because the only way they then learn how to not be disrespectful, the only way they learn how to not be disobedient is to have someone step in and say, that's not okay. Mm-hmm. And the tension that exists between us, that was also supposed to be there because that's mm-hmm. how I learned to love you. Mm-hmm. I learned to love you when I go, That tension that it's like magnets that could push us away Mm -hmm. is actually what draws us together because that love that exists us is going to draw us together. Mm -hmm. The fear I think that exists for parents is, like you said, what if this was the one time I got onto my kid and they really are done with me? 
Mm-hmm. What if this is the or time? They don't you know, like that's me, the yeah. fear. Yeah. And then when you say it to another person and they're able to say, hey, that's supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to mm-hmm. happen. And trust me, it's going to be easier than you think. It, it, there, yeah. and things are going to come back. But I'll say, said, I, I remember the first time my kid told me they hated me. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. And that felt like the end of the world to me. Yes. And that mm-hmm. sent me into a, wait a minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, had, have I, and I asked that question, did I just cross a line? Mm-hmm. Did, did I just create something between me and my child that's never right. going to recover? I thought that, and that's how it felt in that moment. So I always try to remember that. That's when I'm right. in the when I'm in the presence of of parents in a generation before me uh, or, or behind me, and and realize and empathize, okay, I know how that feels. I know you think it's the end of the world. I know you think you've lost your child forever. Mm-hmm. My kids said they hated me too. Did right. you not tell your parents you hated them? I did it all the time. <laughs> I don't remember. And see, that's the thing. I you don't, don't even remember. remember. I don't remember. Yeah. I'm sure I did. Yes. Or, or at least at the very... You're if confident I didn't, you did. If I didn't say the words, I did. I do remember one time when I was a teenager, um, uh, me and my mom had an argument, and I was leaving, going on a trip with my youth group at church, and I said something to her. I don't remember what I said, but it brought her to tears. Mm. And I got out of the car, and I got onto the church bus with a friend of mine who was in that same youth group who had a horrible home life. He mm-hmm. did not have a good relationship with his parents. And I sat down next to him and he saw what I, he saw my mom crying. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said to me, he said, if I had a mom like yours, that woman would never cry. Mm-hmm. And it shaped me as a teenager. Mm-hmm. And I went, maybe, maybe I need to reevaluate what right. I'm doing. It had nothing. My mom didn't do anything wrong. She, she, she took the brunt of that moment mm-hmm. in her life, and I don't even mm-hmm. know if she remembers it. I haven't talked to her about it. I don't want to talk to her about it. I'm ashamed of it. Yeah. But that <laughs> moment, I, I got that third person. He was somebody who was a little bit older than me, mm-hmm. in, in that he wasn't a leader in the youth group, but he was quite a bit older than me. He was mm-hmm. like, I was in middle school. He was like senior or maybe mm-hmm. just graduated. And um, just his presence in my life of waking me up to that showed me um, that I needed some change mm-hmm. right there as a teenager. And you talked about having people in your life, oh, yeah. that third adult or that third mm-hmm. person that follows Jesus. Mm-hmm. And my mom put me in places where I had relationships with yeah. those people. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, at least during those years, they were more influential than my parents were. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, in a lot of different ways. Now, bringing me up as a young ki- child, of course, my parents were the, the whole deal. But they realized at some point that, I needed more than that because I was not in a place where I could hear her. I, I couldn't Same hear what my dad said. Right? That's how I was with my parents, yeah, and I didn't. And I actually didn't like the other people that she brought in. <laughs> well, However, no. No. once, I, like a year or two into it, mm-hmm. now I, there were times I actually went back. Like yeah. when I came home from college, I would go right. see those people. Yeah, because they actually did matter to me. I just in yeah. the moment didn't like them too well. Well, well even mm-hmm. in the moment, you, you're. As a teenager, you don't want to hear anything contrary to what you believe. Mm-hmm. I mean, because when you're a teenager, or at least in those... Or a adult, person. Yeah, you just... <laughs> well, we can get into that later. But I know in that stage of life, for the most part, you, you, you're you pretty solid in what you right. think the world is like and how mm-hmm. you're going to show up in the world. And anyone that challenges that, you don't like it. Mm-hmm. You, you, and you're, you're probably not even going to listen to it in the beginning. But it stays with you. It did mm-hmm. for me. I can say it did for me. Mm-hmm. And And... It takes a while because you got to get over yourself for a little bit, right? And then, and you got to have some life kick you in the butt quite a bit mm-hmm. to start to realize, okay, I don't have it all figured out. I was wrong about a lot of things, mm-hmm. and even my confidence in what I believed was not covering up the fact that I was just not right. Yeah, <laughs> right. and I got to deal with that, <laughs> and and then it comes back around, and then you remember those kinds of those steady presences in your mm-hmm. life, those people in your life that you say, okay, yeah, they, there was something going on there. They mm-hmm. did have wisdom that I needed, mm-hmm. and I can still lean back on that because mm-hmm. I've still got it. Yeah. All right, well, today we have um, Sawyer Hewlett with us. He's our student pastor, and um, we just want to talk a little bit about relationships and relate how why they're important and kind of what we do as a church to um, make sure that we're connecting and, and helping establish those, re- providing opportunities for people to establish relationships yeah. Yeah. and relational connection. And so um, as a church, we do this in various ways. Um, 
So we'll start with, I guess, adults. Let's talk. Yeah. You can talk a little bit about adults, and then yeah. I'll speak about children, and you can speak about students. Well, this is why we're always asking people to go to the Next Step Center. I know mm -hmm. for many people who are a long time at our church, you've not needed to go to Next Step, so you don't know. But the primary purpose behind Next Steps is we're trying to get people into relationships. I mean, there's lots of different involvement in our church, whether it be serving teams, small groups, and all of that is important for the individual uh, to be able to kind of express their faith in that way, to serve and to, to be involved in a small group. But really key around all of that is these relationships that they mm -hmm. can build in those, that there is something that happens when you serve shoulder to shoulder with somebody. And then when you're face to face with somebody in a small group, there's different kind of relationships that get built there. And in doing so, we're creating opportunities for you as a parent, and I would even say in our parent ministry, it's really, oh, yeah. built, you know, and I know we talked about that with Jason, of having these places where you can look at another person and say, I guess I'm not crazy. Right. You know, I'm not the only one. I'm not one. the only one. Yeah. So I think. Or you might be the only one, but there might be somebody that says, okay, you're the only one dealing with that, but I'll come alongside with you. Sure. I'll, yeah. I'll, that's I'll right. come alongside you for that. Or I'll just be here. That's right. So I think it's critical cool for adults, but we also do the same thing for our kids and our students. So mm -hmm. what's it look like in see kids? So in see kids, it looks like we provide consistent environments for them and alive, exciting environments that they feel welcome in that allows them to feel comfortable. And then we've can, then we connect them with different leaders on a consistent basis. Um, our activities always involve some kind of connection activity where they're just spending time with an adult, um, usually two to three in each class, depending on what's going on. Then we teach the curriculum and things like that. But at the end of the day, um, the most important things that happen on a Sunday morning in see kids is relationally based. Yeah. And I would say if you're a parent, I know for, for me with my kids, I really try to emphasize all the time uh, how much I appreciate and mm -hmm. how much I, you know, love these leaders that are investing in them, both to the kids. When they tell me a story, I'm like, oh, yeah, isn't Miss Dana so great? Or, right. oh, yeah, isn't Mr. Joe so cool? Or whatever it is. But also to those leaders, I want them to know, hey, what you're doing is making a difference in my family and in my kids' lives. Because we're trying to, I want, at that age, you know, my kid, most likely, and, you know, my kids struggle with a lot of different things. But as far as their mental health struggles, it's it's never that huge in those yeah. in those <clears throat> elementary ages, unless something has really kind of tragically happened. Um, but it's not something where I'm going, hey, you, I need you today to be ready to talk to Mr. Joe or Miss Dana. No. It's I want to create the rhythm of when you're old enough you know church is the place where you can talk about all these different things. Mm, and that these adults love and care about you. Yes. And they're here to be part of your life. Absolutely. Which then transitions to Sorry. when you have a student and they no longer want to talk to you as mom or dad right. uh, because whatever they're dealing with, they feel like, oh, you know, I know what my mom's going to say. I know what my dad's going to say. Even if it's good and positive, there comes a point that, in those middle school years, those high school years, they start to think, okay, well, I've heard this all before. It's, you know, they want to hear it from someone else, just like you as an adult need to hear from someone else. You're, you're not crazy. You're not weird. Mm -hmm. They need to hear the same thing. And how are we doing that in student ministry? Well, I think the biggest thing is just, we have a great group of volunteers that the students in our small groups they are very confident that their small group leaders love them. I right. I have a great privilege of being able to just serve alongside six others who really love Jesus enough to in like be vulnerable with teenagers who right. mm -hmm. are oftentimes not as vulnerable with them. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of view my job, honestly, as almost like the liaison between the student and the parent. You know, the student yeah. at this right. age doesn't want to tell their parents much. And I, that's not a good thing. They And, and maybe that's changing a little bit. Or It's, it's just a thing. It's just, exactly. a, just thing. a thing. It's not good or bad. It's, it's just a did thing. Did you want to tell your parents much then? Yeah, I don't oh, honestly you don't remember. Count. I don't you know don't that count. I count. You're the one that said it. you were going to have your mom drop you off so you could go kiss a girl. Remember? I did do that. So that was the thing that happened. Yeah, I did count. not tell my yeah, mom anything. I did not tell my parents anything. <laughs> yeah, I told them is. what they needed to know and a few extra yeah. things about my friends. I told sure. them when I wasn't going to be home. I told <laughs> yes. them when I wasn't going to be home. That's right. all that they knew. Yes. Yeah. Um, and but, a few others. Yes. But no, I think like I view my job, though, as almost the person who can communicate some of the things that a student wants to communicate to the parents 
to the parents. And I feel like I can communicate some of the things that the parent wants to communicate to the kids to their kids. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the main thing that a relationship with, when it comes to like my job is trying to develop relationships with teenagers, not just for myself, but for my leaders. The big thing is just developing trust, you know? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to that vulnerability thing. I I, I can think about just the, the past couple of Sundays um, I've been able to witness the leaders being very honest with the students just about what's going on in their lives. I think students really, really latch on whenever an adult kind of yeah. like mm -hmm. lets them know that their week wasn't perfect yes. or that their week was exhausting because they see that with their parents, but they oftentimes have some conflicted emotions about their parents having a bad week. Sure. Whereas they oftentimes don't see other adults being honest with them. Their teachers, and I'm not like saying that their teachers should be more vulnerable. It's a totally different job, but their yeah. teachers are not often. You know, uh, I'm going through a pretty terrible exactly. divorce today. Let's talk yes. about Math. equations. Exactly. <laughs> it's time to talk yeah. about fractions. If you had this many spouses and you divided yeah. it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But. Let's talk about let's talk about one half. Like one half of my marriage was just over. Getting split. Yeah. yeah, not a good idea. But Sorry. I get your point. And I we will took say, your serious moment. Yeah. And I will say this, I think in in general, there comes a point where, and we talked about this in the first part of the mm -hmm. episode. So relationships become transactional. Mm -hmm. And I think often mm -hmm. with your uh, kids as a parent, you, you don't realize how much of it's transactional. And I will say, especially when those teenage years, the teenager is the primary driving force of being transactional mm -hmm. because they are the yes. ones coming home and saying, what's for dinner? Where are you going to, I got to get to this place. Can you take me there? I need you to buy me this. I need yeah. this to happen. And you are mostly dealing with business type things. But when a parent can enter into the conversation and be the first to be vulnerable, to be the yes. first one, as we often say around here, to say the last 10% of truth, mm -hmm. what I mean is that that part of the truth you don't want to say, saying you had a less than perfect week means nothing. Mm -hmm. A less than perfect week doesn't, I mean, everyone has a less than perfect week. Coming in and saying, I really yelled at my boss today or, or at a, a coworker or man, someone yelled at me and I felt really insecure today. Mm -hmm. And I felt this, I will tell you the amount of times I would do that when I was doing youth ministry. And I, it sounds like what you're saying is your leaders are doing the same thing. Right. When that happens, the kid who's been in their phone the whole time or whatever, when they hear you say something they didn't think an adult would say, which is, you know, today I felt, I felt kind of crappy about the way my body looked. Mm -hmm. And then the, the teenager looks up and kind of their, their head perks up. They make eye contact with you. If mom and dad can do that, there. I'm not saying you would regain a bunch of of no. influence on things, but you would you would gain more than you think you would because they just they think they know what you're going to say. When you say something they don't think you're going to say, you gain some influence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and and that even gives them the opportunity that they definitely want for them to be vulnerable with you. Right. You know, I I do think students and teenagers want to be vulnerable with their parents. They just are really. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Teenagers are very, very scared people. Yeah. Right. And, Certainly very insecure. Yes. They are very yeah. insecure. So I would say that, you know, the environment that and yes. the opportunity you guys create in student ministry is that vulnerability with leaders, but also with the students themselves yes. amongst each other. Yes, to exactly. To also begin to develop relationships or expand yes. or create more vulnerability in certain relationships that, mm -hmm. that ultimately um, we want them to have. Yeah. Because, and you want this. I, I know so many parents who, because your life is so busy. And honestly, I didn't see this when I was doing youth ministry. But now that I have a kid who's in preteen years, I can see it. You used to have this really sweet, vulnerable kid. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just the truth. They were very sweet. They told you everything. They told you things you didn't want to know. Oh, yeah. In fact, my wife and I now regularly say that about our youngest uh, two right now because they're in the same grade and you know they're at the same <laughs> place where they just I mean they tell me all kinds of stuff and there's part of me that goes please stop talking yes. you're talking all the time and my wife and I will go there's going to come a day where they're mm -hmm. not going to want to tell you anything mm -hmm. and my oldest is kind of at the beginning of that mm -hmm. and I can see how um, you know you're already going to be at church on Sunday so you don't mind bringing them to small group but when when there's a student event 
and it's on Sunday afternoon, and you go, you know what? This is lunchtime with the family, and I, I don't, I don't get any time with them anymore, and I don't want to give that up. Or, you know, they've got a small group event on Friday night, and Friday night's always been movie night for us, and I don't want them to go do that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I don't want to lose because I don't have any of that time anymore, and you're really trying to grasp onto that time. I'm telling you, if you are, if you would be willing to loosen up your grip a little bit, you would let them be invested in the these leaders, mm -hmm. it will pay off dividends for you in ways that you will never even know maybe right. because they will tell the leaders things that are going on with them and the leader will handle it and you won't ever even know it happened. But your result will be a kid who grows up with a little bit more confidence, mm -hmm. a kid who grows up feeling a little bit more secure. And most importantly, they will they will have more grounding in their faith so that at some point you will look back, hopefully, and you'll say, you know what? There's a lot of things I may not have gotten right as a parent. But the one thing I know is, man, I really invested in, in their relationship with other adults because mm -hmm. they are going to find someone to talk to. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And often the people, and this is, this is why I think teenagers love their friends. The reason teenagers love their friends is the same reason people fall in love and rehab. <laughs> okay, Very here much. you go. It's the same reason. The reason. <laughs> so take there that. There you go. That should be our. Uh, that should be our real Charlie. Just those words. The reason kids love their friends. Teens in rehab. That's in the no, thumbnail. No, okay. teens on rehab. It's like the free. That's uh. right. So the reason people think they fall in love in rehab is because they've been through the same experience and they have the same thoughts about their experience. So they're so connected and in love. Yes, because the chemistry is very high. Mm -hmm. Suddenly this thing that I thought was very unique, mm -hmm. that only Mine. me, and then I talk to someone else and they tell me, and I go, oh, that's just me. Well, teenagers are the same way, right? Mm -hmm. When you come to a teenager, when it, or say this, when a teenager comes to mom or dad, right? Or even I'll say this with our student leaders, and they come to an adult, and they say, girl, I told this girl I loved her and she broke up with me after two weeks. And you start thinking, dear Lord, dude, you're going to be over this in a minute. And in a month, you have the same conversation about a different girl. Yes, <laughs> but that same, you know, teenage girl or whatever tells her friend and she goes, I can't believe it. He's the worst. Let's go get milkshakes right now. And mm -hmm. let's, you know, mm -hmm. and they're going to go do that. What they feel in that moment is they get me. Mm -hmm. They get it. Mm -hmm. They get what I'm going they through. They see me. And what, here's what you don't we want. All want. We all want that. What you don't want is for them to feel like the only person who gets them is an idiot teenager. Yes, that's yeah. the thing. <laughs> that's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's reality for almost everybody. Oh, yeah. Now, they're going to find that. But like Sawyer said, you don't want that to be the only yeah. person right. they find that with. I, and I've said this, I said this to my friend, uh, my, my, my uh, children a lot about their friends. I said, look, I love that you have these friends and I love that they care about you. I'm just telling you now, at some point, have you ever looked at one of your friends and gone, man, they're really dumb. And they, they all go, yeah, my friends are oh, pretty yeah. dumb. And I go, great. Love them. Love be them. friends with them. But know how dumb they are. Yeah, <laughs> but that's why you bring in, in some, you yeah. have, as part of those relationships, yes, you have this yes. adult that is part of it as well, because yeah. the adult is going to be yeah. the one that hopefully you have created this opportunity and time for that child. And now they know I don't have to go to this dummy over here. They, yes. they are my friend. I yes. love them. They're part of my life. They're important. But when I need to talk about something real or when yes. I need to see if, you know, I'm right in my thinking mm, or whatever, yeah. the same thing we do as adults with some of our help, yes. our relationships and wise people in our lives it, you want the kids to be able to do that. Yeah. I say all the time that uh, my parents had, um, they were leading in our student ministry and I could not stand my mother <laughs> in that moment. And she would, she and I talk about it now. We, you know, we, it was just not a good time for us. But what saved me, it was the fact that there were other leaders. Yes. And so I couldn't understand how some other people thought my parents were awesome, but I could, but I also thought other people were, and yeah. it made me realize, okay, well, I'm, my I don't really like everything my mom has to say, but this lady over here who's saying the same thing, to be yeah, honest with right. you, I can hear it from her. Mm -hmm. Well, and I do think there's that moment, and every youth leader's experienced this, every every parent has experienced it, where either, you know, the kid comes home and says to mom or dad, oh, guess what Mr. So-and-so said? They're so brilliant. And the mom or dad goes, you know, oh, I've been saying that the whole time, whatever. My experience when I was a teenager and I and I and I I would talk to other teenagers, and they would they would see it too. And I think this is why 
parents got to, you got to ease up a little bit. I, I feel it too. I get it when my oh, kids yeah. go and say, but you have to ease up. What the kid realizes is, oh, it's not just my dad who says that. It's not that they yes. forgot that you said it. It's that they realize it. And I, I used to say this to people all the time. When someone would come to me with an idea that I hadn't thought of, right? That, or was even in opposition to something right. I was doing. And they'd go, Nathan, I, I don't know about this. And I would go ask someone else for a second opinion. The original person goes, so it wasn't good enough when I said it? And I said, no, because you were one person. Right. You were one person. See, and when I talked to a second person, I got their opinion, right. and suddenly now there are two people, and I'm the idiot who's wrong. Right. Yeah, see, and like the, <laughs> the really great thing about just the, the nature of the church, I think, is I, I think about a time when like my family was going through just a really rough season of life, and my parents were just depleted by it. I remember, like, my parents were, like, trying to be, like, Sawyer, don't give up on the church and all that stuff. And I'm like, whatever. And I remember, like, See, very distinctly. Parents sound like I don't, that. My I, parents I, sound nothing I, like that. But here's the thing. That's Why like, do they sound like D D Goliath from Davy and Goliath? We all have a sentence okay. that our parents oh, said on Davey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> goodness gracious. Oh, Davy. <laughs> but, uh, no, my... <laughs> Can I hear for you? I, you just... Torpedo this whole conversation. Uh, <laughs> no, you did by doing yes, the voice. I'm not okay. gonna lie. Fair I enough, didn't hear enough. a word. What did you actually say? Because I could only yeah. hear the. He said, yeah. "Oh, Sawyer, don't yeah. give up on the church." That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that whale that comes out in Elf. Oh. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> Charlie feels the need to cut oh, all of this God. out. <laughs> anyway, um, you no, um, you had someone else in your life. Yeah, the point is there was like several other adults yes. who were able to speak the same things that my parents were saying, but because I viewed them as like, wow, they actually still have the energy to follow Christ, yes. whereas my parents seem to not right now, I can actually trust what's being told right. to me right now. And, and your kids are going to experience that as well if they're... If they're yeah. present at church. And yeah, we've got to put them in these opportunities. We've got, we, we're, we as a church try to create these time, this time and these opportunities for these relationships to happen. And so sometimes we just say, show up yes, and be there exactly. and put your, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what those relationships are going to yeah. look like. Yeah. But if you consistently point your child towards that, whether it be yeah. a Friday night event or a Sunday morning or, you know, whatever it might be, a parenting mm -hmm. event that you consistently show up and your kids are showing up for that, that's when God will do the rest. Yeah. So this will be, as we're kind of wrapping up this episode, this will be the last push I want to have. We already talked about it in the, the part with Jason as well. We need more teenage parents showing up to the parent ministry events. Mm -hmm. um, you Big need time. it, as we've talked about. You need it for your relationships with these veteran parents, with just other parents who are in the middle of it. We already mm -hmm. talked about that. But at that same place, you need to come and you need to bring your students to. Sawyer's doing things at the same time, mm -hmm. events to build relationships with those students. They need to be there. You yeah. need to be there. And currently, we just do not have as many uh, student ministry parents who are there as we do children's ministry parents. And you need this. This is not something we need. Right, we were not as a church. There's, there's nothing no. we even gain from this. There's nothing. It's not like not I get when you look and you go, oh, they're asking me to give money, or oh, they're asking me to volunteer. There is no nothing. benefit to us as a whole church uh, operation to right. look and say this is a thing. This is totally a thing that you and your family need, and we as a church want to do this because we are a family. Right, yeah. and the, our overall health as a, as a family grows when we're yeah. when we're together. Yes. That's right. So. so come on down. <laughs> Sawyer. Come on. We're never coming on this podcast ever again. Oh, mark his word. Never yeah. again. He'll be here the next time we invite him. Don't yeah. you worry. That, don't worry about that. <laughs> don't you worry. And you be. should be back next week. Absolutely. But if you want information on the parenting event, we yes. will put them in the show notes because we have one coming up. Um, I sure. don't think there's one in November. The one in December is going to be one for your whole family to come, and it's yes. going to be really fun. So make sure that you sign up for that and be there and come check it out. So um, also, we'll take questions. We'll take uh, confessions. We'll take thoughts on how good Nathan yeah. and I are doing, That's whatever true. it is. Send us in impressions of, of Sawyer's Sawyer. voice. We'll take it all. Just no, send it in. send in impressions of my impression of my parents. I'll take either one. Yeah.
We'll take if you whatever. Got, if you guys got mean riffs on Sawyer, we'll play them. You can, we'll play them on there. Absolutely. You can even have your kids do them because, you know, you got students <laughs> that are Sawyer a lot. And then, my oh kids gosh, probably do. They would be excited Please about that. send us that info. We could just have a second podcast that's to not great Sawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bunch of Sawyer stuff. And I'll tell you this. The sad part is it might get more views. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just kidding. That's true. That's true. I'm kidding. Thank you guys for being here with us today, and we will see you next time. Have a good day.